Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Community Tech Data Hub. Uh, welcome to our viewers uh, online as well. My name is Vladimir. Um, before we begin, we'd like to thank uh, the Data Service Generation Network Program, uh, which is development and uh, implementation of ultra high speed digital infrastructure to interconnect digital innovation hubs within the province. So NGNP is offered through a partnership between the uh, Center of Excellence in Next Generation Networks and uh, Ontario Centers of Excellence on behalf of the uh, Government of Ontario. Uh, we'd also like to say a big thank you to uh, Sutan Sivanesan and Lisa Klimtra for offering their time today for one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, to discuss uh, project fit with your companies after the session um, when it ends at 1 p.m. today. So Sutan is the business development manager at OCE and Lisa is the business engineering manager at Sim. Um, if you did not get a chance to uh, for me with the event bright do an introduction, uh, please just reach out or on the event bright. Data Hub actually help. Um, we do so through uh, informative and data focused awareness initiatives such as the Data Hub uh, session today and smaller tactical uh, work. And uh, uh, finally, just making events like uh, enterprises, SMEs. If you'd like to get uh, to know more, just um, you can reach out to us through either our website, so communitech.ca slash um, data, or the ngnp.communitech.ca, or you can send uh, an email to uh, morrow.rossi at uh, communitech.ca. With that said, I'm pleased to introduce um, today's speakers from Merospace, Eric Meeker and Fred Schell. Um, Eric is at Merospace. Uh, he has grown up uh, he was a member of uh, senior management at Exact Perk uh, Limited uh, from its inception in 2007 uh, until 2013. So Eric was instrumental in establishing the spin-off of ComDev, which has deployed a constellation of uh, low-orbit satellites for global ship tracking. Eric Shell is the VP Operations at Merospace. Uh, previously, he was uh, at Exit at Hurt, where he helped um, transform a traditional IT department into a working information factory with 100% plus uptime over the first year. Uh, Fred has over 20 years of information uh, management uh, experience, international management experience in the technology industry, specializing in increasing structure and efficiency by continuously improving processes and building strong, innovative teams. Please welcome Eric and Fred. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Let me, get, let me get us switched over. Yeah, you got it. You have to learn, but you got to start on slide one, please. <laughs> pay no attention to what's on the screen until we're ready to go. And pay no attention to the animation that you're about to see. <laughs> I'd ask you to pay no attention to it. There we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a great turnout. Um, I'm, uh, we've been looking forward to this opportunity to share some of the things that we've learned uh, about uh, operations and the Internet of Things business. The Internet of Things is the latest buzzword, and it's, it's really a revolution that's happening. I think many of you are in the IoT space. In fact, let me just ask the question. How many of you are in the IoT business one way or another? Pretty much uh, half, about half of you said yes, another bunch of you are too busy uh, or too shy. So <laughs> the uh, IoT business is real change in a lot of ways, as you all know. And we're going to talk about the, uh, the implications for how you run operations in, a, in an IoT business. But just by way of background, uh, in, in our intros, we pointed out that we've been doing this for a long time. I started in the, in the mid-90s with my first big data operation where I led the team that transformed what was then a big paging industry onto satellite communications. And in that system, we built a, a nationwide system that transported, uh, we were dealing with uh, over 200,000 pages an hour for 
a single customer. And so we learned the, the realities of real-time operations to make sure that happens. Uh, I've got a lot of war stories, and I learned a lot of lessons that we're not repeating anymore uh, in those days. And then, as uh, Vladimir mentioned, back in uh, 2007, I was recruited by Comdev, and we built a whole constellation of satellites to track ships uh, around the world for navies and coast guards. Um, in the, my last two, couple of years there, I ran uh, data management and operations in conjunction with Fred, who's here. Uh, Fred and I together began to understand some of the nuances, some of the things that make uh, IoT different from a real time from uh, traditional IT operations, and we'll both talk a little bit more about that. And I'm hoping to share some of those lessons with you, give you some guidance, so that hopefully you can avoid some of the mistakes we've made in the past. So the key point that we want to talk about is if you're starting have an IoT business, how do you plan to scale your business? Generally, you scale your business by getting more customers, and if you're an IoT, more sensors out there generating more data. More data, more customers equals scale. Hopefully that also means more revenue, more pro ultimately some profits, and that's er pretty good. But when you're gonna scale the operation, the real focus uh, is cloud, cloud computing. That's the thing that most people think has really enabled this to happen, because you don't have to buy computers anymore. You can just get them from Amazon or from Data City or from somebody in, uh, that you want. But I'm here to tell you that putting in the cloud is not a success strategy for scaling an IoT business. It's part of it, but it's actually not the most important part, and we're gonna show you why today. So to show you why, I wanna talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the evolution of an IoT startup, and all of you will recognize this. But when you start out, you're really vision-driven. Every one of you who's in this room came up with an idea, uh, or were partnered with somebody who came up with an idea, and it started off as something you weren't really sure was gonna work, but let's put some work into it, figure it out. So you're really driving a vision. I've identified a problem, I think I can solve it. I read the Lean Startup, I joined Communitech, start, to start putting uh, some plans together. Then you get a little bit of money and you put a little team together. Now that team might just be you and your co-founders uh, working in your basement, or it might be bringing in some money and hiring a few people, it might be collaborating with fellow students at the university, there's a lot of things that can happen. But as you grow that team, you're really driving innovation. That's when you begin to realize that uh, you know, the things that you, in your original vision, not everything worked out just exactly the way you thought it was, so you uh, change your plans. Oh, I'm sorry, you mean you pivot. Pivot is the, is the right word for, for that. So you pivot until you find something that really has a problem that you really can't solve, and now you're really focused on being innovation-driven. I think, I don't know if, we only have one battery in this thing, so I don't know if it'll make it all the way. And then once you get that first product out and you're demonstrating some capability, now you move to the sales. Now the big milestone, I get my first customer, my first beta is complete, and most importantly, my first dollar of revenue. My first dollar of revenue comes in, and I'm beginning to grow a team. I've got a salesperson. Maybe that's the entrepreneur. Maybe you bring somebody in. And now you've got the, the be-all, end-all of Lean Startup, which is the MVP, the minimum viable product. Now you've got, a, you've, you've got some revenue flowing, and now you know you're under pressure. I've got to go show you know, month-on-month growth. I've got to drive growth, growth, growth in the IoT business. In IoT, it's a little harder, because quite often that also means deploying physical assets, uh, sensors out there. So that runs a little slower than, say, a mobile app that, that can be immediately distributed to the whole planet. But nevertheless, growth, growth, growth is where you're going because what you really want to do is get to be a scale-up. And when you're a scale-up, you can go for more money. Maybe you actually make something. There's this magic thing that, that is legendary in the, in the startup business called profit. And, uh, and that can happen. It really can happen, right? And, but it happens after you start to scale up. You never make money on your first customer, your first 10 customers, sometimes not on your first 10,000 customers. But the point is you have to do that. Uh, you, you, that's the real goal. And then once you're scaling, then it's a whole different set of problems and you're looking forward to, to uh, dealing with those problems, but you're in a different game then. But the point here is that as you build your startup, you're, you're evolving from a focus on uh, innovation at the beginning, where it's all about development, creativity, you know, fail fast, fail early, fail fast, fail often, fix it, pivot, all of that dynamic stuff that startups do, 
But then when you get over here on the operational side, now you've got 10,000 sensors out there or 1,000 sensors, whatever is appropriate for your business, and you've got 100 customers or 10,000 customers. Well, they don't really want you innovating on their dollar, right? They don't, they want, they paid you for a service, they want that service delivered. And that's what generates revenue for you. So, and everybody knows that it costs a lot more money to get a new customer than to, or to, uh, to get a new customer than to keep an existing one. So now your focus has to be a little bit on the operational side. And this is the piece that we're gonna talk about today because that's is really fundamental. So when I talk about operational focus, what am I talking about? talking about this, the, all the activities that go on that are involved in delivering your services to your customer. That's production operations. That is not the same as IT. IT is keep the servers up and running. Well, Amazon will do that. The lights are all green. But if the lights on the boxes are all green and Amazon says everything's fine and your customer's not able to log into your portal, you're not generating revenue and you're generating bad customer service. So production ops is the, is the everything that it takes to deliver your services to your customer. And that means three groups of things, people, tools, and processes. It, notice it's not really about software, right? It's not about suppliers like Amazon doing it for you. It's about people, tools, and process. That's your responsibility. Those people, tools, and process, there's a whole bunch of things that they have to do. And you can look through this list and you can say, oh, well, we don't need to do that yet. But you're going to have to do it sometime. Maybe it's not a hard problem. Not one of these is out of the realm of any of you in this room. All of these are, it's not rocket science. It's just work, but it's really important work. And if you don't do it, you, you can run into serious problems. And then to make those work, there's even more things you have to do on the outside of that to enable the functions to happen in your people, tools, and process. This slide is really, really important because I talk to IoT companies all the time who think that it's just going to be, I'll just put it in the cloud. You know, I, I'll put, I've got this magic software, I'm going to put it in the cloud, and the money will just start flowing in. Right? Oh, yeah, maybe I'll get a salesperson or a marketing budget, and then the money will just flow in, flow in, and they forget about all this stuff. Typically, we've been doing this combined 50 years. Um, it takes about three years to get this right at scale. Three years. So that's a long time. Now, everybody can cope and do it, but it takes a long time. It's also really expensive. We studied, we analyzed uh, 40 public software as a service companies, which is the closest public analog we could find for this. And we found that on average, these companies spend 32% of revenue on operations. How many of you think that's a big surprise? So we talked to a number of people who say, no, 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 it's going to be 3%, <laughs> right? So if you think about your cost of cloud, oh, it's not, only, it's not even going to be 3% because it got free service from IBM for, for two years. So it's going to be zero, right? This is the reality of what re successful companies spend in this. So the next thing that people talk about in operations is it's too early, right? We're just a startup. It's a luxury problem. And so they make mistakes. They, they deal with it wrong. And I want to walk through these a little bit. So they plan to pay for, uh, plan their budgets call for a tenth of what is really going to be needed, 3% instead of 30%, right? Now, for you, it might not be 30%. It might be 10% or 20%, or it might be 75% early on because the denominator, your revenue base is low, and fixed cost and low revenue means the percentage can be really high and can be really high for a while. The percentage isn't important. What's important is to remember you have to get the work done and it really costs money. The second, next point is they focus on innovation MVP. Wait a minute. All the books say MVP and innovation. Innovation, what, it's in the name of, the, of our hosts here. Innovation is everything. MVP is the holy grail. No, that's minimum. The first M is minimum. And if that's all you focus on, then when that MVP turns out to be as successful as you dream it will be, you will run into problems because you're not ready for success. And that's the challenge because you've treated operations as tomorrow's problem. It's a luxury problem. 
first let me get the product out the door, then let me get some customers, then I'll have some money or I'll be able to raise some money, then I'll worry about operations. Right? That's, that's a problem, and I'll show you why on the next slide. Then they forget, well, I've got a plan, I'm going to get my funding in, and then I'm going to go hire some people to do this for me. But they hire them, okay, we're going live, we just signed our biggest customer ever, we're going live next month, so I guess we got to hire a couple of people to, to look after the operations. Well, guess what? They're not that easy to find. You've, some of you probably had trouble finding good staff uh, to already in, the, in this community because the economy is so hot it's hard to find, and then they, they get the wrong, uh, they're hard to find. The next mistake they make is, oh, they're hard to find, and I don't, wanna, I don't have any budget for extra people anyway, so I'm going to, but I've got really smart guys. How many of you have a part, someone in your company who is really super smart on the technical side? The rest of you, you're in trouble. <laughs> but uh, seriously, you say, well, look, I know we need a monitoring system. Brian's really good at that stuff. He could code that in a weekend. Okay, so we'll do that. Okay, now who's going to run it? Well, Brian, because he wrote it. And he did it in a weekend, so it's just kludged together. Right? Oh, and who's going to wake up in the middle of the night when the monitoring system fires off? Well, Brian's the only one who knows how to fix it, so it'll be Brian. Is, what else is Brian supposed to be doing? Well, you know, release two is due in six weeks, but he's dealing with this other stuff. So there's a problem. So we don't want to bother Brian, so what do we do? We go hire, go to Conestoga College, we get some funding, we bring in a couple of co-ops, maybe one co-op with a little li computer science background, maybe some of the year or two experience. Keep the thing running. That's your job. Just, if it breaks, get it up and running. If you need help, call Brian. But just keep it running. Right? It's really important. When's your term up? Um, no, no, you can't, you can't go back. You know, we don't have a replacement for you. Uh, end of the week? Okay, can you train Brian on everything he did for the last 12 weeks? That's, that's the way you do it. Why do you do it that way? Because it's tomorrow's problem, and I'm focused on today's problem, which is making payroll, getting the product out, and getting some customers. Right? So it's not that people are dumb. They just set, set priorities, and they forget about this. So the outcome of this is what we call the valley of despair. And I want to take a minute and talk about the valley of despair. Um, I've been in this valley more than once. So has Fred, more than I have, actually, because uh, he's been done more of these than, than I have. So what, where you really start off is you're over here, typically, in an early company. So you, you're getting some customers, and you're beginning to get things going, and everything looks like it's being happy. You're looking for that next round of funding. You're looking for the next customers. It's beginning to happen. And then your first customer crisis happens. Did you know you were down for six hours last night? Well, yeah, but it was the middle of the night, and you know we figured we found out when we came in at seven o'clock in the morning, and we fixed it by nine o'clock, so you should be fine. I'm paying you <laughs> to have that up 24 hours a day. What do you mean it was six hours down? Didn't you know it was six hours down? That's a crisis, especially if it's your first paying customer. I know because I did that with a paging system in the Midwest, and we were serving doctors all over the Midwest and I was down for hours, hours, like every three days. It was a disaster. So trust me, this is not where you want to go. So what do you do? Well, you start, you go to, you start distracting people. You grab your best team. It's, you've got to have your best people because customers are the most important thing, right? So you get Brian, you know, and Susan. <laughs> uh, and they come in, and you drop everything, fix the customer problem. So they go do that. And they clued it together and it's back work. He said, okay, it should be fine now. And you hope it doesn't happen again, but it does. And so then you start missing promises because Brian and Susan were working on fixing the problem and you missed your deadline to get version two out. So now you're in a big problem. Now you're at the bottom of the valley. Now it's an existential threat. And what I call this is the exit path of the serial entrepreneur. So you, somebody gets replaced, usually the CEO. They move on. Somebody else gets brought in. Or the company gets bought, so now your dream of, of, of a big payday is gone. Or even more often, you just go out of business. Or you do whatever it takes. Susan and Brian manage to 
say, okay, I need to bring in some consultants. Money's no object because it's an existential threat. We're dead if we don't get this right. Drop everything, fix it. So you fix it and you start to develop some process. And over time, a year or two, because your customers don't trust you anymore, you can get out of the valley and survive it. And so this is a path that I've seen, I've lived it, I've seen it. This is really fun, but very stressful. This is fantastic. This is the worst time of your life. Right? And so avoid that. So this is why we call this the Valley of Despair. And it's a serious, it's a real threat to your existence, but there's a way to bridge it. It happens because you underinvest at the beginning. That's why. And when I say invest, people underinvest because they don't think they have any money. I can't afford to hire an ops team to do that. We don't even have any customers. I shouldn't be spending any money on this. So don't spend money. Spend a little bit of your time. It's more important to think about it and plan for it than it is to spend money on it. You have to spend something. So you can't spend a lot at the early stage, but zero is the wrong answer. So that's why you underinvest. And then the, the result of underinvesting here is you make a huge overinvestment here and you, spend, you can spend a year digging yourself out of the valley. What happens to your investors when, yeah, my month-on-month -month growth, well, I've stalled for 12 months because I had to make the system stable, right? That's an existential threat to your business. And, that's, and you avoid it by doing it, uh, by bridging that gap from the very beginning. How do you do that? Well, the first step is to understand the nature of your business and what's really core to your business and, ha and what has to happen. This is the view that everybody in the IoT business has. You've got some sensors. They might be standard temperature sensors off the shelf and you just manage the data or they might be something really complex, like a satellite constellation, but there's a sensor network that's out there that's producing data, but nobody wants to look at 10,000 e e EKG charts, and so you've got some software that does the analytics. This is where you create value. You transform the data from the sensors into something useful, even if it's just a formatted report. It's, that's, your, that's your transformation, and that's your value uh, creation here. And then you got to go and persuade customers that they should pay you to do that. And then you get customers. Three steps. Data source, transformation to information, getting and keeping customers. That's the core of any IoT business. And the way to th that you should think about this is that the MVP that we're all focused on, the minimum viable product, is really about uh, getting sales, getting those customers and getting them excited. You don't get customers unless you have a product. You've got a product, you have to demonstrate something, but then making it work, you know, a million times a day or ten, a thousand times a day is a different problem. Operation is what delivers value. So you have two elements, value creation and value delivery. Creation is the creative, innovative work. That's the MVP, that's the smarts, that's the brainchild, that's your vision. The operation is the boring stuff that nobody wants to do, but it's what actually delivers value. I used to ask the question, uh, who delivers, who generates revenue in an IoT organization? And a lot of people think that the sales department generate, delivers revenue. And the sales department doesn't. Sales delivers orders. Operations delivers revenue. You earn revenue when you ship a product to a customer. That's when revenue is generated by Gap and by every, every analysis. That's the job of operations, not your developers, not your sales department. They're all three important, but there's a different role. So understanding that is really crucial because they're different skill sets. They're different jobs, different skill sets, and the failure to understand this kills lots of companies. So how can you bridge the valley? So I wanted to give you some s practical advice we could talk for a whole day on this topic, but we tried to get it down to one slide. So no shock, figure out what your, the first step is, figure out what your scaling requirements are. How big do I have to be? How many sensors, how many customers, how much data is gonna happen, say a quarterly forecast for the next two years? Doesn't matter if it's right, I guarantee it'll be wrong, but at least you have a plan, generally have that already. Then think about the operational requirements there. Everybody thinks about cloud computing. Well, it's no problem because Amazon's cheap. I'll just spin up some more servers if I get lots of customers. 
Well, sometimes multiple servers don't actually serve it, but it's not the key. What about the procedures to maintain that software? How are we going to change the software? How often are we going to, are we going to do a, a, a weekly or monthly release of new features? Who's going to implement that and who's going to make sure that that doesn't take down your previous system? Who's going to decide whether you have two environments, a development environment and a production environment? Somebody's got to do that work. So figure that all out, make a long list, estimate the costs, and I'll talk a little more about costs on the next slide. Hire or partner with an operations leader who's got operations experience, not, an IT not a junior IT person. And lots of IT people have operations experience, but you know, essentially all operations people will have some IT experience. Not all IT people will have operations experience. You want someone who's been involved in delivering services to paying customers and who understands the full breadth of what it takes to deliver services to customers. Research and select the operational tools. So remember that bubble chart with 20 or 30 different functions that have to be done? There's open source software and paid software for every one of those functions. It's all out there, it's all on the web, just Google it up. But you saw how many there were, there's three or four choices for each one of those, all good. All you have to do is Google it, read all the reviews, sign up for a trial, try it out, test it with your partners, see if the people who actually have to use it like the interface, and then you're done. 30 or 40, 50 times. That won't distract you at all, will it? So think about doing that. Somebody needs to do that without distracting your team. Then once you've chosen your tools, now you have to design, implement, and document them. Okay, we're gonna use, uh, uh, we're gonna use JIRA to tr for a trouble ticketing system. Oh, there's no problem, the tool's right there. We just turn it on and it runs. Wait a minute, it runs? Don't you have to put users on it? Yeah, well, who's gonna maintain the user list? Don't you have to set up permissions? You know, who's gonna do that? Somebody's gotta do it, and people forget that. Oh, Brian can do that. Oh, no, he's busy, we'll have, you know, have Sally do it, right? Don't they have anything to do uh, besides this? So you gotta watch out for that. That takes time. These five and six take time. Doesn't necessarily take a lot of money, but it takes time. And if you don't plan for it, it's gonna be, t that time will be taken away from your development plans and your sales plans. So whether it's the CEO or your engineers doing it. Build your teams in advance of scaling. It takes a month or more for an operational person. So as you begin to scale, you're gonna say, I need somebody to mo use the monitoring tools that we just built, monitor it, to deal with an outage. So if something happens in the middle of the night, somebody will get out of bed, go over, log into the system, reboot it, do whatever's needed, somebody's gonna do that. So as you begin to hire people to do that, you wanna hire low cost people, because it's not a, it's not a you know, you're not gonna hire masters or PhDs to do that work, you're gonna hire people that, where that's a great job for them. Because it can be a really rewarding job for the right person, but it takes time to train them. And if you forget that, you've, uh, you, you're too late. And then of course, when the forecast changes, oh yeah, we're, we're not gonna have, we got this giant order that now we think we're gonna close in six months that wasn't on the horizon when I planned all this, now we're gonna be three times the number of sensors. What does that mean? We're gonna have four times the number of customers or one quarter the number of customers, have we got the right plan? So now you have to iterate through this plan. But if you take this slide, print just this slide out, you'll be able to use this as a checklist of things that have to happen to make sure you've covered all your bases. It's not rocket science. You're all smart enough to do all of these things, but how many of you would have thought of all of these without, uh, without prompting? Probably not very many. So, when you think about costs, when money's always tight, so costing is uh, of all this, I want you to think very thoroughly about cost. Cost is, all, as I said, people budget for one-tenth of what they need. So you start with the cloud cost, which is what people think. Well, I'm getting it for free for two years, and that's an eternity, right? Well, wait a minute. <laughs> What's it gonna cost you to get your data out of there after they sign you up? Um, but then you have to add the true costs, which are really in people. So look at those operational requirements we just talked about. There's time to do it. Make a list, that's just a project. Make a project plan, figure out how much time you're gonna put into it, but that's real money that it costs you. If, if Brian and Sally are doing it, that's time that you're paying them to do that, do that work. Make sure that's in your plans. 
when you, you have to plan for monitoring. Somebody's going to be watching this 24-7. If it breaks at 1 a.m. or 1 p.m., depending on what time you guys like to work, uh, when, some, when you're in bed, somebody's got to get out of bed and fix it or deal with it first thing in the morning. So whatever monitoring is right for your business, make sure you're allocating some money there because that's a real cost. As you get bigger, you'll have to hire people to do that Right? So it may not cost you cash at the beginning, but it will cost you cash in the long run. Uh, maintenance. People forget about maintenance. Oh, there's a security release for the firewall you're using. Right? Who's going to implement that? Well, Brian, because he's the only one who knows how to do it. But you can tell Brian's getting pretty busy. My CTO's named Brian, so he's used to he, he knows this. Um, and then this on-call support. But then add one more thing. As the CEO of your company, and the, most of this is aimed at the CEOs here, Look at the cost of the opportunity cost of distraction. That's the, the biggest one that's missed is distraction. There's a deadline at, you know, every one of you's got a deadline ahead of you. It might be six months, it might be next week, but you know exactly when that deadline is. It's when you run out of money or when you promise the investors or when you promise the customers. So you got a deadline, and what happens if we assume that Brian and Sally and the rest of your team are working 100% on the deadline and suddenly they take a week to go solve a problem that was created six on your last release. So add some cost into that and make a little spreadsheet. And then you'll know what it's really costing you for operations. Then you'll know what it's worth to you to solve the problem in another way. As a CEO, you then decide consciously, I'm going to accept those costs, I'm going to adjust my deadlines appropriately, but I'm going to accept those costs and not raise more money or not spend more money or I don't have any more money so I can't do anything, but at least I'm not going to promise things I can't deliver because I have these costs. And then when you do your budgets, you'll roll these in. This, will, this alone can save your company. So let me just talk a little bit about how you might uh, look at this. There's these, this is the full function, it's the end-to-end -end function of an IoT company. So Build, you know, that's your vision, then you build the product, go get customers, produce the product and deliver it and support your customers. The point here is that your core, your core value add, the core part of your business is going to be on these things. That's where you're creating value. That's what differentiates you from all your competitors. You have to do that right. That should be your core focus, but not your only focus. You also have to look after the production operations on this side. Somebody has to do that. It's not going to help you win against your competition, but it'll certainly cause you to lose against your competition if you don't do it well. So it's not your competitive advantage over there, but it's still critical. And because it's critical and not core, it's an opportunity for outsourcing. So there's another way, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about that, which is you can get help to do this affordably uh, on the outsource side. So. With that, I want to turn it over to Fred. We're going to take a moment to change uh, microphones here, and I'll turn, this, uh, turn the mic over to Fred and let him talk to you about his experiences in all of this, as well as uh, uh, how you can take advantage of outsourcing as an alternative. working. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so Eric and I met, that's probably seven, eight years ago uh, at the company Exector that he mentioned earlier. Uh, I was brought in <coughs> at the time that the company was transitioning from a startup to a scale-up. Uh, data perceptions, and we have Scott in the room today, uh, they implemented the infrastructure, the security, uh, basically the processing infrastructure for Exactors. But at that time, it was time to start building the operational team to get the processes in place. And that's where they brought me in. Uh, I've done that type of work throughout my career. I've done m many different uh, uh, startups. And the goal was to do the same thing for Exactors. And we got that going after a while, two, three years. 
Um, at that time, Eric and I started a discussion, and Eric basically challenged me. He said, okay, this is satellite industry. This is very special, all hocus-pocus, a lot of a lot of value in the sky, this has to be very special. And my response was, no, it isn't. It's actually very simple. In the early days of my career, I was fortunate to visit a Heinz ketchup factory, which has nothing to do with IoT. Uh, and I learned a lot. It's, it's, it's a factory, similar as if you go to a bread factory or to the Toyota plants here in Kitchener. You have goods coming in. You need to make sure that the goods are coming in on time that they're at the right quality, then you process it, and once it's processed, you do the delivery, and it is not till you have delivered the goods to the customer that successfully you can send them an invoice and you have a high chance that they're gonna pay you. If you fail in any of the three phases, you can send an invoice, they're likely not gonna pay you. Um, so you're seeing a diagram here that uh, has a lot of information. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna dive too much in there, but you would see a description of what we, okay, that was not what I expected. <laughs> All right, F5. And then we skip through it again. All right, sorry about that. Let's see where we left off. Here we are. Uh, I wanted to press the pointer. That's where it went wrong. Uh, I just mentioned the three sort of areas that you will see in a standard factory. There is the receiving component, there is the processing component, and the distribution component. If we tie into what Eric said earlier, your MVP fits into the processing. You will have some specifics on the web vis and the visualization part potentially, and obviously your sensors. All the rest around it is standard stuff that you need to operate a factory. Whether you put tomatoes in a bottle or you put IoT data through an, an analysis piece of software and into a report, it's the same type of uh, work that needs to be done. Um, following up on the discussion that Eric had, we started thinking that what we created at Exact Earth could we apply that to other companies? Because we had a group of operators, operational people, customer support, they did great work, but we had the feeling that they could do more. And the whole idea was, could we do outsourcing and let those people do the same thing for other companies and create a win-win situation for all the parties involved? For the customers, as we could deliver the operational services at a cheaper price than if they would do it themselves, because they were likely early in the process, they were not able to hire all these people and have these processes handy, and they would get that level of service right from the beginning, and as we would get more value out of the people that we already hired, we could make extra money, so there was a win-win situation at the end, which is obviously the goal if you go into outsourcing. Uh, we're currently at the point that all of this has been built and standardized with a focus on the IoT industry, uh, we have several customers out there. It started off with the maritime industry, which was a follow-up of the work that we did with Exact Earth. Uh, we have a contract with the Canadian government where we get ship data from satellites, we analyze it, we and ship that further off and send that further off to the Canadian government for various things. Uh, we do uh, appliance monitoring for an organization. Uh, that organization created sensors that goes in the appliances. The appliances tell us on a regular basis how they're doing. And if something changed in the behavior of the appliance, that potentially could be an early sign that the appliance is dying, the service uh, people are being informed and we s they serve their customer by addressing failures of the equipment before it becomes a problem to their organization. Uh, we have a tie in food processing. We're involved in a project with water treatment plants where sensors are measuring the quality of the water that's going through the water treatment plant. And if something goes right or wrong, we, we see that in the reports and we provide that information back to our customers so they can uh, service their customers well. 
um, University of Guelph we're talking to for the agricultural area. Uh, for me, this was a whole new thing. At the end, if you think about it, it's quite logical. Uh, farmers driving around these days with tractors. The tractors are measuring all kinds of conditions about soil, nutrition, etc. That's being analyzed. Uh, informa information flows back to the farmer, and the farmer, or actually the tractor, the equipment is being told what needs to go where in the ground to get optimum uh, results of the land, and obviously mu much more efficient for, uh, for the farmers. Uh, there's a lot more out there, but in the interest of time, I want to leave it with that. Uh, coming back to the earlier question that we had, how will you scale your business? Well, we put a big cross by put it in the cloud. The cloud plays a big role. Back in the days, you would buy equipment. It was a lot of money. It was a big bottleneck for startups. The cloud has helped you with that. You can, with very low money, you can get processing equipment going. You can scale up, scale down when you actually feel it's necessary. But the cloud does not build your operation capability. Once you have your MVP and you actually need to serve customers, you need to get operations going. Um, and, and as Eric explained, that's not an easy thing. You need expertise which is not automatically already living in your organization. You can ask Brian, but Brian is not an operations person. He's wired in a different way. He's wired for innovation. He's not wired for operations. Uh, you need people which are around, but if you want good people, it takes time to get them. And obviously you need to train them. You need to get your operational processes in place. The team needs to get used to that. It's something that in itself takes time. It's not easy. And by just counting on that the cloud is doing it for you, well, that's the lesson we want to give you. That's not going to happen. So the three things that we want to give you today, sort of as, as lessons learned out of today, there is the valley of despair. I've done, well, I've lost count, but probably somewhere between 20 and 30 startups through my career. And they all struggle with this. So it's out there. And you're likely going to see something of that as well. Uh, if you look at operations and look where, if, if you're starting up a company, where your value is, your added value, it's not an operation. But you have to deal with it, and once you start dealing with it, it could be a distraction of where actually your value is. And as a result, we wanted to give you the message that operation is, is a candidate for outsourcing. Uh, you met already Eric. Uh, you met me. We have another individual today here. He's in the back there. That's John. He represents sales for us. Uh, we're going to be around here for another half hour, hour. If you have any questions, feel free to approach us. If you want a meeting with us, then obviously that can be arranged as well. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for today's opportunity. I hope it has been educational. Uh, Eric, do you want to add anything?
Thank you very much, Eric and Fred. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for our questions and to our viewers online. You can also um, pose your question and we'll address uh, those as well. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll pass along the, uh, the catch box here. And then when you're done, um, if there's another question afterwards, feel free to throw it and, um, and for the next person there. Any questions? Any questions online? I have a question for okay. everybody. Well, while we do it while everybody's thinking about it. I just like uh, a, little, a little check here. Um, often asked what ops grok is. Raise your hand if you have no idea what the word grok means. All right, about half. That's more than I expected. Uh, so uh, I'm a huge science fiction fan, and Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land uh, uh, is, one of the great, is one of the great science fiction uh, books uh, that I always liked, and grokking is a Martian word, and it means a deep and intuitive understanding of something. So when you grok someone or grok something, you not just hear them, but you get them completely. And it's a great word, and there's no other English word that means it, so ops grok means we have a deep and intuitive understanding of operations, which we've tried to tell you. You got a question? Just wondering if you could actually raise this up. Oh, raise it up a little bit? Ah, sorry. Yes, please. Here. So I have a question. So OPS Grok, are you guys, um, so what, what's the deal? Like, do you want to become a permanent part of this uh, startup that will grow? Or are you coming only uh, sort of in the first phase and then you create that process, you provide total like, you know, education and uh, stuff and when, say, for example, the scale-up should go into more people, that will be already the company's problem, and you sort of give all of the IP rights on the process to the company. So, hopefully this, I'll just hold it up here. Um, that's a fantastic question, thank you. Uh, the, our goal is to build long-term alliance relationships with our, with our clients and our partners. Uh, we are, our whole company has been built on strategic alliances. I, for many years, sat on the board of directors of the Association of Strategic Alliance Professionals. Think of us as your, a contract manufacturer of information. So the model we use is exactly the same one that we have. I, I put it in my briefcase, but anybody got an iPhone here? Anybody use an iPhone, or is it all still BlackBerry in this room? Uh, th there's an iPhone over there. Question for you, how many iPhones did Apple manufacture last year? Zero. There you go. 10% <laughs> of the people I ask that question will get the right answer. Zero. Apple doesn't manufacture phones. Foxconn manufactures. Apple has $200 billion in cash that they don't know what to do with. It's the largest corporation in the world. Why don't they own their own factory? Because it's not core to their business. Core to their business is product design and marketing. Same stuff we talked about. What's core to Foxconn's business? Manufacturing excellence. We want to be Foxconn for data. Right? So we partner with our customers on a long-term basis, not in a total lock-in. So there's always an exit path. Um, you know, whatever intellectual property has to develop needs to be available. We're not locking people in permanently, but we're hoping to earn a permanent place in the in the uh, in the company's business, the same way Foxconn is lock is in with uh, with Apple. It's a, exactly the same metaphor, and it comes from the ketchup and peanut butter factory m metaphors that, uh, that we like to use. So it's a long-term relationship. We build the factory for you. We operate the factory for you. But it's to, you, to meet your requirements for producing your product, which is information. So we manufacture that information, support the product and the flows. In the IoT world, it makes a lot of sense to do this because the data is highly structured and the products tend to be very standardized, just like in electronics. So this is a, it's an innovative model that uh, can go there. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Nobody. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, we've got one. So just could you confirm, so the, in terms of Waterloo Region, what companies you currently working with? So I, I 
we're always under NDA, and so in a public forum like this, I don't want to don't want to name uh, name the companies. But Fred, uh, some of these were were at proposal stage, some were in negotiation stage, some were fully under contract. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, the parent you know, Opsgrok is a business unit of Marospace, which company was mentioned. Uh, Marospace is the provider of all the ship tracking data to the entire Canadian government. Uh, so you, we've been in this business a while. Uh, we're still a small company. Um, we'll be making a pretty, Marospace will be making a very significant announcement either tomorrow or early next week, which we'll, uh, we're, we're very excited about. Uh, but we're, we're active with a number of companies in the fields that, that Fred mentioned on, on his slide. We're based here in Waterloo. We work with a data center here in Waterloo, but we're also able to work with other data centers elsewhere. We're always looking to grow. We also have partners in Germany and Denmark, we work in India, so we're, we're kind of all over the place. And I, we can probably talk a little more detail in, in a less public forum. Other questions? <coughs> no? No more questions? The online people are all right. doing emails. <laughs> Okay, well thank you all very much and we'll be around, we'll, uh, we'll be in the corners of the room here uh, for a little while and please come over if you, uh, you'd like to talk a little more. We'd love to get a business card and come and, uh, come and visit you uh, and uh, chat with you and learn more about your business. And Eric and Fred, um, thank you again uh, so much for your time and uh, for coming here to present and uh, share your insights on how to effectively scale up operations in the cloud. Uh, we've put together a little uh, token of our appreciation there uh, for you as well. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. okay.